Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining our session today. This session is Cloud Networking for the Hybrid Enterprise. My name is Zach Siles. I'm here with my colleague, Matt Nowina. Matt and I are both networking specialists in the customer engineering organization within Google Cloud. So we work on a daily basis with customers such as yourself to help kind of onboard them, understand networking within Google Cloud, how to best take advantage of our networking features, and more specific to this session, how to best integrate with your existing on-premise networking environments. We do have the Dory Q&A enabled for this session. So if you have the next app, you can click on Dory Q&A and pop questions into the app. We want to make sure we have enough time for all the content in the presentation. So we're not going to do live Q&A today. But the Dory is open through the end of the month, so through April 25th. So if you have questions during the session, if you have questions after the session or when you get back home, pop them into the app. Matt and I look forward to interfacing with you online. And we may even blog about a few of the questions. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. So a quick summary of what we're going to cover in the next 50 or so minutes. I'm going to start out by talking about Next, familiar networking concepts that everyone's familiar with from your on-premise networking environment, and how those map into the Google Cloud. So if you have kind of direct correlation between things, I'll make the connections for you. And I'll really highlight how some of those things are different in the Cloud versus what you may be familiar with in terms of your on-premise network. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Matt's going to talk about some common enterprise designs and some recommendations for how you can approach those, talking in a little bit more detail about the features that I've talked about, how you actually leverage those based on our recommendations. And then finally, we're going to come back together and we're going to talk about some best practices, so what we typically recommend to customers as they start their journey towards Google Cloud. All right, so let's jump right in. Again, I'm going to start with kind of some of the common networking concepts, and I'll map those into what their equivalents are inside of the Google Cloud environment. This is the current state of Google's global backbone network. Um, so we have our own private backbone network. It's one of the largest private backbone networks in the world. Uh, one of the unique benefits of cloud networking is that within a few minutes, through configuration that you define, uh, this basically becomes your infrastructure. So you can you know, extend your on-premise network environment literally across the globe based on which cloud regions you deploy, compute, and other workloads into. And that's really the premise of this presentation, which is how do you extend your on-premise networking environment with things that you're familiar with, but do so in a way that's scalable, manageable, and hopefully with as little design and operational burden as possible. So again, essentially, this is basically your backbone network completely under your control. So let's start with some very familiar kind of constructs. So your on-premise data center environment uh, undoubtedly is made up of physical network devices. These devices are commonly purpose specific. So whether we're talking about a core switch or an access switch or maybe a firewall, whether it's physical or virtual, um, these devices in your network are often put together in a very specific topology based on those capabilities. And where those devices are placed and how you connect them is very relevant to how the network performs and what capabilities it has. Now, data center topologies have evolved over time. You had your traditional three-tier kind of core distribution and access networks. And you have this resurgence recently of kind of cloth-based fabrics where you have spine and leaf networks. But generally speaking, in your on-premise network, the topology, at least the physical topology, is generally fairly static. So it doesn't change that much. So we have the concept here of the device. We have the concept of placement being very relevant and important in terms of what those capabilities are and how they apply to the things that you're, you're actually connecting to the network. Next, we have different capabilities for how you virtualize that physical infrastructure. So for example, you have virtual LANs or VLANs that allow you to provide virtual segmentation within your physical topology. You can even have isolation from an IP forwarding perspective. So for example, you can have VRFs, virtual routing and forwarding instances. And historically, there's been some provider-specific implementations of these capabilities. So for example, maybe virtual data centers or VDCs, and various different types of overlay and underlay technologies. The premise here is really the same, right? How do I basically virtualize and isolate different capabilities on top of the same physical infrastructure? So here again, we have the virtualization concepts, VLANs, IP forwarding domains like VRFs, and sometimes virtual data centers or VDCs. Moving on, we have what I refer to as kind of network identity. So when you talk about how you identify systems, particularly from a network perspective, um, it's no surprise when we start talking about IP addressing and subnets that these kind of exist pervasively everywhere, right? They're in the public internet. They're in your private network. They obviously exist in the cloud. 
But what I'm specifically talking about in this context is the importance of what an IP address actually means about the identity of a system. Like, I know these range of IP addresses are my database servers, or these range of IP addresses are a DMZ where I want to kind of apply a certain type of traffic controls. Um, and placement is also important here, right? Oftentimes, where something connects to the network says a lot about what it is and implies what types of access it has or it will allow. And much like there's a low rate of change with physical networks, there's typically a pretty low rate of change with the number of subnets and VLANs and IP addressing schemes that you configure in your on-premise network. I mean, certainly they change and expand over time, but they're generally not changing at a high rate of volume on a daily or weekly basis. Now, if we've gotten this far and you're thinking, great, Zach, IP addresses and subnets, I'm super happy I came to your session. Just be patient, please. I promise we're actually going to help you think about these constructs in a different way in the cloud that hopefully makes your cloud journey a little bit more simple from a networking perspective. Next, we have various different types of traffic controls from a data center perspective. So you have firewalls, right? These, again, can be physical or virtual devices. You have network-based access control lists. You may apply these at various points in the network. So these are more like very network-centric. You create these based on IP addresses, subnets, interfaces, et cetera. Sometimes you have host-based filtering through agents or other things you actually install on the endpoints. And finally, uh, more recently, you have kind of, I think, an emergence of what I call drop-by-default fabrics or networks, where multiple hosts are connected to the same network. And whereas they may have historically been able to automatically talk to each other if they could discover each other, that's no longer the case. These networks or fabrics actually drop most unicast traffic by default, which requires that you must explicitly configure what communication is allowed across that network. So I've got here a set of controls for how I actually identify and filter traffic. So that's where we kind of came from, right? We have the devices. We have the importance of placement of those devices based on their functionality. We have the network-based virtualization technologies. We talked about VLANs. We talked about VRFs. Um, we talked about access control capabilities. And so now let's start to map these into their equivalents inside of Google Cloud. So the first one is really the device. What does a device mean? What is the equivalent of your on-premise network switch in the Google Cloud environment? And there really isn't one. <laughs> so this is funny for the first one. There's really not a direct equivalent. And this is really a byproduct of the fact that most everything inside of the Google Cloud environment is heavily software-driven and globally distributed. So there's really no equivalent to, I have this network switching device. What is its equivalent in the cloud? It just doesn't exist. Now, that being said, we do actually surface some capabilities as devices. This is primarily from a configuration management perspective. So for example, when you're setting up routing between your network and the Google Cloud network, you configure that routing using something called Cloud Router. Now, Cloud Router is presented to you as a thing you configure, but it's not actually a device. Behind the scenes, it's actually a distributed set of software processes that live within a particular cloud region. So you're not actually configuring a device. You're basically providing a configuration that we then program these software processes with and distribute them across the infrastructure. Uh, in a similar fashion, you have the VPC firewall, the native firewall built into the virtual private cloud in Google Cloud. We present this to you from a configuration perspective as a single global list of rules. So it's very simple to configure. You can kind of see everything in one list or one page. But in reality, what we're doing is we're taking those rules that you configure, and we're actually pushing them down and programming them at the host level on the individual machines where your virtual machines are scheduled. So really no equivalent from a device perspective, but we do kind of manifest that in a way that's convenient for you for both configuration and management. Next is the mapping for network, right? So we have our physical network. We have virtual networks in our on-premise environment. What's the equivalent in Google Cloud? And this is the VPC, Virtual Private Cloud. This is our uh, global VPC, and it's really kind of the direct correlation with your IP forwarding domain on-prem. A lot of customers have just a single IP forwarding domain, which is you have one routing space, one IP space, and there's a lot of similarities between that and the VPC in the cloud. So for example, the IP addressing inside of a VPC and inside one of your forwarding domains on-prem has to be unique, right? You generally avoid duplicate IP addressing. Uh, likewise, you don't generally automatically connect two networks together without some explicit configuration. So in your on-prem environment, you may establish uh, connections between networks. You may establish BGP routing protocols between networks to actually explicitly make communication happen. Very similar in the VPC environment, right? VPCs are isolated. 
and that they do not communicate with other VPCs inside the cloud unless you do something explicitly to make that happen. Um, one interesting thing about the VPC is it is a global construct in Google Cloud. And what that means is that the scope of the VPC, how big of a geographic area it actually covers, is completely dependent on how you deploy workloads in the cloud. So for example, if you start out by deploying your workloads in one cloud region, that's really the scope of your VPC. But as soon as you start deploying workloads in other cloud regions across the globe, the network scope immediately expands to include that entire network. And so this is actually pretty unique to Google Cloud. And it's actually a really, really nice implementation because it allows you to basically instantly grow your network in global scope, kind of going back to that global backbone slide that I presented at the beginning, with a single routing and firewall policy. So your network, your VRFs on-prem, they map into VPCs in the cloud environment. Next, we have the concept of VLANs. So we only use VLANs in a very limited fashion in the cloud. We don't use them actually within the data center switching fabric, meaning you don't put your virtual machines inside of a specific VLAN. We only use VLANs to actually virtualize the connectivity back to your on-premise environment. This is specifically with a product we have called Cloud Interconnect that allows you to have high speed, low latency access from your network to Google's network. But you can actually create multiple virtual links across those physical circuits and terminate those in different VPCs in different locations across the world. That's it. There's no VLANs anywhere else in our environment. There's no VLAN numbering you need to think about, making sure that you put uh, you know, access, control or access lists to map interfaces to a certain VLAN. That just doesn't exist in the cloud environment today. Next, we have subnets. So show of hands, who in the room remembers deploying workloads in Google Cloud before we had VPCs and subnets? Anyone? Few people. Um, so it's true. It used to be one big flat IP space across that entire global backbone I mentioned. But as customers started connecting to our environment in more different geographic locations, we needed the ability to provide them with optimized access from a routing perspective to the closest cloud region where they're deploying workloads. And that's really the purpose of the subnet inside of Google Cloud. Um, I would advise you to think about it as less of an isolation me mechanism, less of a segmentation mechanism, and more of an identity regionally for instances that you deploy in certain cloud regions. So for example, you can deploy resources in a cloud region on a single subnet, so long as that subnet is big enough from an IP addressing perspective to handle all of your workloads, so all of your Kubernetes clusters, all of your virtual machines, et cetera. That's really the genesis. That's the primary purpose of subnets. They're really not intended to be kind of a first-class entity to identify systems. It's about efficient routing between your environment and our environment. So your subnets, they map into subnets in Google Cloud, but the purpose of Google Cloud subnets is really about regional identity or regional proximity of resources. Then we have IP addresses. So our IP addresses within your VPC, they're regional constructs. So you create a subnet within a, v within a particular region that has a unique set of IP addresses for that region. We also have public IP addresses that are used for our global load balancers that are internet facing. For the regional IP addresses, these are by default automatically managed by the cloud. So we automatically allocate IP addresses to machines. We auto automatically allocate IP addresses to Kubernetes pods, et cetera. So I want to actually um, ask you to do something. As you kind of go through this session, I want you to think about what if you don't have the ability to explicitly define the IP address for a given virtual machine? This is already very common in Kubernetes, right? You can't specify that a Kubernetes pod has an explicit static IP address. Assume you can't do that with a virtual machine. How are you going to handle forwarding? How are you going to handle access control, micro-segmentation? Right? We're going to talk about some of these things a little bit later. And finally, the equivalent for the firewalls in your environment or in general access control, we have a number of products. These are, again, globally distributed. And they really kind of span layer three controls, so building access controls based on IP addressing, all the way up to layer seven controls. So does this user who's part of this group have the right access to actually interface with this cloud API? So there's a complete spectrum of access controls that cover a lot of different parts of the stack from the network all the way up to the application level. Um, so again, this is important when we start talking about segmentation um, and the ability to kind of abstract how we identify and control a system separate from where it's actually placed in the network. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk about some common enterprise design scenarios and how we can approach those. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are, are public presenters, but this is normally the, the part where you get stuck looking into the lights and forget everything that you've prepared. But uh, 
what, what we really wanted to talk about at this next stage is how do we start mapping these analogs into Google Cloud solutions specifically. So here you get a snapshot of what the, the Google Cloud networking product portfolio looks like today. Uh, there's 20 plus products and services all focused on enabling your journey to the cloud. We've, we've sort of grouped these into different sections that represent the way that customers are thinking about the cloud. So connecting, scale, optimize, security, and modernize. And so what we're going to do in this next section is we're going to touch through a series of these products and sort of answer questions that customers come to us with. So in this section, what we're going to focus on are the cloud interconnect, VPN, and VPCs. So one of the first things that customers think about when they're, they're coming to us is, how do I take advantage of this new network? Uh, oftentimes, when you have on-premise environments, you have fixed infrastructure and fixed locations, but you don't have the way, a way to uh, extend your applications to where your customers are, improve the, the speed and latency. And so that's where, as Zach was mentioning before, global VPC comes into play. This is uh, a way of simplifying the ability to connect to all of the regions where you deploy things, makes it simple for you to enable replication across your applications, as well as leveraging Google managed services that are built from the ground up on uh, a, a global or a multi-region deployment model and the associated availability. The next thing, once we've sort of started to map out the network, we start to think about, well, how do we fit this into our operational model? So by, by show of hands, how many of you no longer have dedicated networking or security teams? So there's a few, and we know the industry is moving towards DevOps models or DevSecOps models, but until we, we sort of fully move into that, we have to think about how can we, we take our workflows in our on-premise environment today and map those over to the cloud. This is where shared VPC comes into play. So shared VPC is designed around the idea that we have different teams that deploy our applications and different teams that uh, manage our networks. And we don't just want to give free reign to the application teams to deploy networks as they see fit. We still want to have some level of control. So shared VPC is enterprise friendly. It's a centralized model. And it allows you to centralize your administration and auditability. So now we've got a global VPC. We have a deployment model that works. As Zach mentioned before, we want to look at, uh, I mean, we're a hybrid enterprise. How are we going to interconnect into uh, GCP? And it's important to, to note that you need different models depending upon uh, what you're going to rely on that hybrid connectivity for. Are you just doing management? Do you need to do batch data loads at certain times of day? Or is this going to become a mission critical part of the application? This is where things like Cloud VPN, Cloud Interconnect, uh, come into play and being able to map the your requirements and your your costs to the the exact implementation So what does it look like when we start to put these things together? This is an example uh, a bit of a zoomed in simplified example here But starting on the left hand side you can see an on-premises network with four dedicated interconnect uh, connections coming into Google Cloud these are, are coming into two separate regions that are, all, are both accessible through the global VPC. That VPC is stored within a shared VPC host project, and we can share individual subnets out to the service projects. So again, it's a relatively simple way of leveraging physical connectivity, ensuring a 4.9's SLA, and giving you centralized administration. So from here, one of the other common questions that we, we get, um, and I was sort of confused when I, I first heard this, but there's some customers who are surprised to hear that our managed services are typically hosted on the internet, on external IPs. Uh, now, Zach and I would probably be among the first to argue that you know, simply putting something on a public IP uh, really is about uh, accessibility and not security. But for customers that have invested in uh, these interconnects that want to leverage this private connectivity for accessing the managed services, it makes sense to have an option to do so. And so that's where we start to introduce uh, private Google access and private service access. So what these are are ways of extending those managed services to your on-prem environment. I'll pause for just so can, as people take pictures, but what it really looks like is this. So that same interconnect model that you had before what, what you're now able to do is to um, 
as a part of your dynamic peering with, uh, with, with Google, is you're able to advertise a restricted VIP back to your on-premises environment. So this is a special IP range that will come from your VPC to your on-premises environment. And then through the use of DNS, you can swing services over to that restricted VIP. The three basic models for, for using this are, the first is to do an enterprise-wide uh, CNAME of star.googleapis.com to the restricted VIP. If you don't want this to apply to all of your services, what you may choose to do is implement a DNS view. So uh, a view only for certain clients uh, uh, implementing the exact same redirection, or you can even implement it at the host base level. So we've talked about connectivity. Now I wanted to spend just a few minutes on security, um, and most, more specifically on our Cloud Armor, IAP, VPC firewall rules, and Cloud Firewall rules. So, no one is going to consider leveraging a, a cloud service provider if they don't have complete faith in the implementation of firewalling. GCP VPC firewalls provide uh, a micro-segmentation model because they are effectively implemented at the host base level. What that means is two instances running on the same physical host cannot connect to one another without traversing that firewall. And the default stance for that firewall is a deny ingress. At the same time, these rules are stateful. So they're simpler to maintain than more traditional stateless ACLs. And we can see this segmentation model implemented in the following slide. So again, this is a, a relatively simplified model here. But when I started thinking about this, I, I, I have a question. How many people have had to implement 802.1x in an on-premise environment? So there's a few people. Um, this was, this was port-based network access control. So this was introduced at, at a time when we no longer knew what endpoint was going to plug into what switch, so where in the network they might be, and be able to dynamically configure that port with the associated rules for that endpoint. Well, the same thing can be done with VPC firewall rules. You, through the use of tags or service accounts, you can uh, have your endpoints inherit the rules that they need in order to uh, access the correct uh, endpoints. And you can do this uh, you know, very similar to, to 802.1x, but without the pain of having to manage TACX. So with this combination, we have granular rules that are applied dynamically uh, within our VPC. And then as we start to push out towards the edge, we have Cloud Armor and Identity Aware Proxy. Cloud Armor will extend our defense in depth strategy by adding layer seven uh, DDoS and uh, web application firewalling to our, our apps. And IAP provides a way of extending our applications to only specific users. In fact, we've, we also introduced uh, quite recently a blog post that talks about using IAP in place of bastion hosts. So now you can open up uh, 22 to your individual hosts that you want to manage, but ensure that's only exposed through, uh, certain, to certain identities without the need of having a separate management host. The, the, the next part, and this is a really critical one, because we've all heard repeatedly of these stories about misconfigurations of access rules on a managed service that end up exposing data to unauthorized clients. So how, you know, how, do, we, how do we address this? Well, Google's actually taken a two-pronged approach to this. The first is a set of open source security tools called for SETI which give you the ability to establish an inventory policies and remediation actions whenever changes are made within your environment. And the second is VPC service controls, which allows you to establish a trusted perimeter model around your VPCs and projects. So this is what it looks like in practice. So here we have um, a, a project and a VPC and the associated services that we want to protect. We also, through the same mechanism of the, that private Google Access, have the ability to extend these services to our on-premise environment and say that's a part of our trusted perimeter. So when VPC service controls is enabled, only resources from within the perimeter can interact with those services, and they can't be used to copy those uh, to any external unauthorized projects and prevent access from the internet. So this protects against that misconfiguration. Lastly, all of these security controls are great, but centralized logging and SIM solutions are not going away. So this is where VPC flow logs and firewall logs come into play. 
The VPC flow logs provide you with NetFlow style data, TCP dump information without the payload that gives you information about the flows within your, your VPC environment, and firewall logs gives you insight into what's being allowed uh, and blocked by your VPC firewalls. So now that you have a sense of the various products, the analogs to the on-prem, what the options are in, in GCP, what we wanted to do was try something a little different. You know, as, as network specialists, Zach and I get the chance to see many different customer configurations. And then this next section, we wanted to try and verbalize the thought process that we go through when considering different sets of customer requirements. Before we start that, I just wanted to give you a few quick points uh, in terms of VPC design pre-work and recommendations. So the first is identifying who your stakeholders are. This can vary depending upon who you're trying to design this VPC for. Is it for an individual application, a line of business, your entire organization? It's important to understand who you're trying to address and make sure that you really understand their requirements. The second is to start with security objectives and not security controls. Many times we see customers come to uh, to GCP and say, how do I do X in GCP, rather than thinking about why they're doing X. So by starting with the security objectives, you have a very clear understanding of what you're trying to achieve and what your options are in the cloud. The next is understanding how many VPCs you're going to need. And I don't mean coming up with a, a static number, like five, six, seven, ten. The important thing here is to understand what you're trying to achieve where your scale and quota limits are going to, to play, and get an overall understanding of, of what uh, magnitude you're going to have to address. And lastly, think simple. Don't design things just because you can. Um, I mean, we all know that uh, simplicity allows, is directly correlated with supportability. So keeping it to exactly what, what you need is going to be important. Anything you wanted to add on this slide? No, I think the point of number three is, is relevant, right? It's not a static number you're trying to get. It's really a pattern that you're trying to use so that you can, can grow and scale your network environment inside the cloud in the most efficient manner possible. Yeah. So let's start with uh, a simple scenario here. Zach, like, wh what do you see in this, in this initial? Sure. So um, again, the idea here is we're just, this is kind of basically our day job, right? So how do we kind of think about the, the approaching this um, out loud? So obviously here I've got a single VPC, global, pretty straightforward. Looks like I have both development and production workloads in the same VPC. They're across different regions, so they're in different subnets. Um, single project, which is, also, which is also relevant when we look at how we scale out. Um, and the other thing that's apparent here is it looks to me like this is predominantly a cloud isolated workload, right? I don't see any hybrid connectivity back um, to the on-premise environment. So those are kind of the things that initially pop out at me. Any, any best practices you think we can take away from this design? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple here that really resonate with me, um, something you just mentioned, which is start out simple. Um, so I think this is a very common approach that customers who are either new to cloud can take, just so they kind of get their bearings in the cloud environment. Um, or even customers that are coming from other cloud providers and they're just trying to get familiar and ex have experience with how some of our networking constructs may, different, so for, may differ. So for example, the global VPC, how does it actually behave in practice? So simplicity is, is a key one here. I think the other one here too is um, just a small number of subnets with larger address ranges, right? There's no really reason to kind of over-rotate and start creating a bunch of subnets within a region. You can start with one with adequate IP address space. We have a great feature where you can actually grow the size of your existing subnets in a completely hitless manner to the VMs that are already deployed. This doesn't preclude you from creating multiple subnets. This is just what we see and what we would recommend for customers who are just getting started, right? One nice thing here is that things are relatively um, programmatic and easy to deploy and manage inside of Google Cloud. Um, so even for core infrastructure, stuff that takes a lot of planning and a lot of effort to implement in an on-premise environment, they can actually be pretty disposable and pretty easy to kind of delete and recreate inside of the cloud environment. So I think overall a good starting point. Um, one thing I do notice here, though, right, and I think a, a pretty common recommendation as customers start to scale in the cloud is really um, kind of starting to segregate or put more kind of firm isolation between development and production workloads. So you mean something that looks a little more like this? Um, so in, in this design, uh, there's a couple of things that jump out to me right away. I mean, the, the, 
The first is, is exactly what you, you've uh, sort of identified there. So we've moved from a subnet model as a, a isolation boundary between our, our different environments and into VPC level. So at VPC level, we've now segregated firewall rule management into two separate VPCs. And then the other big one that jumps out is the hybrid connectivity. So here we can see that we've now deployed cloud routers, uh, dedicated interconnect, and VLAN attachments into each of the individual VPCs. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just a point kind of on the hybrid connectivity, right? If you notice here, we have actually separate connectivity coming from on-premise into each VPC, right? And this is virtual connectivity. So if you're using uh, VPN, for example, these are separate VPN tunnels. If you're using interconnect, this can be the same physical circuit that you peer with Google net Google's network on, but different logical connections, those interconnect attachments I mentioned previously that terminate in the separate projects, right? So you kind of extend the isolation of the different environments all the way through the connectivity back to your on-premise environment, right? So it's really a really clean kind of separation, which, which works well. And as you've mentioned in previous slides, because we now have separate independent uh, VPCs and there is no inherent connectivity between them, we need to start thinking about where, where, how does our application deployment look? Where are our build servers? Where are we actually uh, deploying from? If we're deploying from on-premise, this works. We've got connectivity between them. But if the build servers are sitting in one of those VPCs, we now have to start to look at VPC peering or connecting those VPCs together in order to allow for that build process or that deploy process to succeed. And when we start to think about those, those peering, that's when we need to start thinking about, well, what are the aggregate resource requirements when we mesh these two VPCs together? So when you, when you, you think about this design, what, what's the next sort of logical extension? Where do people go from here? Especially if we wanted to sort of align with that workflow framework from earlier. Yeah, so one thing I noticed when Matt asked who doesn't have network or security teams anymore, there was like a few hands. And so if I assume the inverse, I assume that most of you still do. And so one thing that we see, um, if we can go to the next slide, is this concept of shared VPC that Matt talked about. And so to me, shared VPC is as much an organizational construct as it is a set of technologies that you leverage in the cloud. And what I mean by that is that shared VPC is designed for organizations where you want to maintain centralized administration and control of the network and the security functions in the cloud. And so shared VPC does that. Shared VPC is still fundamentally a single VPC, but it's a single VPC that can be leveraged by multiple projects, and it has a curated set of permissions, of IAM permissions. So there's a specific role for network admins in the shared VPC, and they control, as you might imagine, creating subnets, establishing hybrid connectivity, establishing routing policies. There is an explicit role for security admins in the shared VPC model who control firewall rules, et cetera. So if your organization is structured in that way, and that's an organizational construct you intend to carry over into the cloud, the shared VPC is a really nice model for this. Um, so here you can see we've got a couple of things in play here. We've got actually multiple different VPCs all still within a single project. And in the shared VPC model, we call this a host project. So your host project has all of your networking and security stuff, the VPC, the firewall rules, the connectivity back to your on-premise environments. And then you have one or more service projects. Service projects are separate projects. They're usually given to the application or development teams. In those separate projects, they can spin up their own compute. They can spin up their own Kubernetes clusters. They have the autonomy to manage their workloads themselves. And these service projects attach to the shared VPC to leverage those resources. So the networking and security teams maintain control over the network and security. The application teams, they manage their workloads. They manage compute. They manage Kubernetes clusters, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of best practices, right, just think, kind of thinking about this a little bit, um, you know, number one is I, I like simplicity, right? So we've got still a pretty simple model. It's still the single VPC kind of model, if you will, um, which again kind of just reinforces the point that we want to kind of start to think about non-networking constructs um, as the primary identifier for workloads, right? So we don't want just the fact that you happen to be connected to a VPC to say everything about what you can do, right? There's, there's a better way to address that, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, another nice thing about shared VPC is you actually have pretty granular control on which portions of the VPC are visible to the service projects. So for example, you can say, you know, this particular group of service projects for 
um, you know, service XYZ, they can only see this particular subnet or set of subnets in the VPC, right? So you can kind of help people not make mistakes in terms of deploying their workloads in the wrong location. Um, so this works really well. It's actually a, a very common thing. It's pretty popular with enterprise customers, mostly, as I mentioned, because of that organizational alignment. Um, but question, I guess, back for you is, what if you need to kind of scale this out, right? Because fundamentally, we're dealing with a single VPC. What if uh, things go really well and you need to kind of scale up to maybe you know, tens of thousands of virtual machine instances? Yeah, so I think that's when we start to see a move towards this model, where now we are separating out the host projects and going with a single VPC per host project. This allows us to more accurately align uh, VPC and, and project quotas to an individual uh, host project and allow them to scale independently of one another. So no longer are you going to be worried about uh, you know, if, if a dev resource spins up things that your prod, uh, project relies upon because now they're managed independently. The other big thing that this design starts to, to introduce is uh, segregation at the IAM level. So in the previous models, when you're using the security admin role, within that VPC or that, that host project, you would have had the ability to modify firewall rules across any of the VPCs. In this model, they're now independent of one another. So we can have different users map to each of those host projects. And we're starting to see a scale out pattern here. You know, what we're what we're talking about is you know, building that, that host project segregation at the environment level, so prod, test, dev. But we could continue to uh, make this more granular if our application requirements demand it, where we can create host projects on individual line of business or application. So just so I'm clear, I just want to make sure I understood one thing you said. So the, se the segregation of the IAM permissions, that's because the permissions are associated at the project level? Correct. OK, so, so by moving into separate projects here, you're giving you the ability to kind of delegate administration to different parts of the cloud environment. That's right. But as, as we continue to move out in this scale model, what you can see is now we are increasing the number of cloud routers, increasing the number of VLAN attachments. And while it's a software-defined network on the Google Cloud side, on the on-premise side, we need to think about how we're going to be managing those, those connections. So you know, what, if it's, what if it's a pain on the on-premise side? What can we do to help optimize for that? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a frequent feedback we hear from customers. It's like, it's great. The network in the cloud is software-defined. I can spin things up and delete things with relative ease. But when it starts to talk about hybrid interconnectivity with your on-premise environment, that may not always be the case, right? So getting the appropriate permissions to change uh, configuration, add additional interfaces, create new BGP peers. Um, sometimes customers want to avoid this. And what they're really after basically is trying to leverage not only the same physical connectivity with the Google Cloud network, but the same logical or virtual connections with the Google Cloud network. And so we move on to a different scenario here, which the actual VPC structure here, which you know dev, test, and prod in multiple projects, that really stays the same. The one big difference here is we've actually leveraged another VPC that we're terming here in this presentation a connectivity VPC. Now, this is not a separate type of VPC that you check a box and say, I want this to be connectivity. This just happens to be a normal VPC that we're using in a very specific way. So what we've actually done here is we're actually moving all of the hybrid connectivity out of the in individual environment-based projects, and we're putting that into this connectivity VPC. And then we peer the connectivity VPC with all of those environment-based projects. So this actually relies on a feature that we've just recently released called VPC peering custom routes that allows us to propagate routes that are learned dynamically from your on-premise environment across VPC peering relationships. So the routes that you advertise into the Google Cloud environment that specify what networks in your on-prem environment are going to be reachable from the cloud, we can now propagate those routes all the way down to these environment-based VPCs. So pretty, pretty powerful capability, nice way to not only leverage the same physical connectivity, but to really remove a lot of the kind of hybrid connectivity constructs out of those environment VPCs. Um, another common thing I see as customers grow, a lot of customers, especially larger enterprises, they may have multiple business units or business entities inside the organization. And those entities pretty much want to operate autonomously within the cloud, except when it comes to paying for hybrid connectivity, right? They almost always want to share that, right? So I'm going to use the same kind of high-speed connections I have to the Google Cloud environment, even though I may be an entirely different business entity. So, where we have this segregation here by environment type, like dev, test, and production, you could also think about that to be 
separate logical business entities or small peered groups of VPCs for a particular business entity. Um, name them whatever you want. And inevitably, in that case, there's almost always services that you want to share across those business groups, right? Whether it's Active Directory or source code repositories or the CICD pipeline, those resources are also a good fit for this connectivity VPC because it has peered access to all of those downstream VPCs as well. So this access, again, this is really just about how you use the networking constructs in the cloud versus just going and saying, this is going to be like a connectivity VPC. The, the scope and use of the VPC really defined its purpose inside of the cloud environment. So it's not like you're limited to a single connectivity VPC. This is actually a, a scale-out pattern. Yeah, you could, you could scale that out. I've, I'm working with uh, one customer now where they have 13 independent business entities inside of their organization. Um, each one has um, their own kind of connectivity VPC, if you will. And then they have a set, a small group of downstream VPCs that are environment allied, right? So dev, stage, production, et cetera. Um, so I think are we kind of, we have one more, right? Which oh is one more. So I think maybe we'll do a little curveball here, just thinking about what customers commonly kind of come to us with. I'm going to give this one to you just because I can. Um, so what if a customer needs to bring kind of a third party network? capability or device into the cloud as a virtual machine. Why would you ever need that? Uh, I mean, you know, just, you know, just, just say it's needed, right? How would, you, how would that influence and change the way you're doing VPC design and some of the things that we've talked about? So I mean, wouldn't it be nice if, uh, if, if there were cloud native solutions for everything we wanted? But I mean, the reality is that for any number of reasons, there, there, there are going to be uh, times when you need to bring appliances into the cloud. You need to start to think about what those deployment models look like. Now, the icons are a little small at this point because we're starting to group these things together. But what, what we wanted to, to sort of call out here is the idea that typically these devices uh, require multi-NICs. Um, so you can, you can think of uh, an NGFW that you wanted to do layer 7 inspection on or something that's going to act as a router between your various VPCs. But there are, there are specific rules within GCP that actually require us to modify the, the VPC design. So here, what, what you're seeing is that multi-NIC requires different VPCs for each of the, of the interface cards. And all of those VPCs have to be in the same project. So, so sorry, Matt, just one second. So when you say multi-NIC devices, you're talking about like a virtual appliance a virtual from a security appliance. vendor or something that so has multiple interfaces. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Um, so the, the best practices, the things you need, the, the considerations you need to, to, to bring into play at, when you're thinking about these devices, though, is how are you routing traffic to those devices? Are you modifying the default route? Uh, what are the implications to accessing managed services when you're no longer using the default internet gateway and instead using a third-party device? as well as thinking about high availability. So how, is this, how are you ensuring that this device is up and forwarding packets? Um, how do you health check it? Um, each one of these are, are important considerations, but there is a deployment pattern for using these devices within GCP. Good stuff. So I think we've covered a number of different scenarios, right? I think this is pretty commonly what we see from customers in terms of how they start their journey, really specific to networking inside the cloud. Um, again, the premise here, right, is just start simple. Uh, it's easy to kind of expand and evolve over time as your requirements and your need change in the, in the cloud environment, right? There's no reason to kind of overly um, kind of engineer from a design perspective. Also, think less about the traditional networking constructs like placement in the network and IP addresses and subnet membership as really the kind of primary identifier of a particular workload, right? Is, as Matt mentioned, right, we have capabilities within the firewall to do micro-segmentation that can actually follow a particular virtual machine instance or Kubernetes pod, regardless of where it happens to be instantiated in the network. Right? So this makes actually creating the policies and maintaining those policies inside of our environment much, much more simple by leveraging these kind of abstractions for identity. And so I think that well, do we have any? We have something else, right? You, you have something else you want to talk about. <laughs> so. I almost wish I had a black turtleneck on for, for this part. Um, you know, as much as Zach and I would like to think that you know, a 40-minute presentation on some example VPC deployment scenarios would be enough for, for you to sort of rethink your, your designs, we actually have gone one step further. So we believe that as a cloud service provider, the obligation is on us to provide best practices for these things. And you would have seen as we were going through these, these 
uh, deployments that we had different sets of best practices that go down the side. So I am very pleased to announce uh, during this session that we have uh, just made live our VPC best practices and design guide. So the links that you see up here are links to all the things that we think are important when first moving into your VPC design decision. So we want you to start by thinking about your organization, your line of business, or your project. Where, what are you trying to design for? And then use these links. So bit.ly slash net201-vpc for our VPC best practices guide, net201-ent for best practices for enterprise organizations, uh, net201 policy for understanding IAM policy design as it applies to enterprise customers. You may have also noticed in uh, the past few months, we launched a new Coursera course for networking in the Google Cloud Platform. We encourage you to, to use that if you want to continue to get your hands dirty, understand how these different components work together. And then get started today. Build something. Understand that this VPC design that you implement now uses all the information that you have available to you, but it may not apply in the future. There may be iterations, and that's OK. Um, and lastly, showcase your skills. So we also, another thing that we've worked on in the last few months is to launch the Google Certified Professional Network Engineer. Um, and I've been told there's some uh, pretty cool swag if you decide to, to go and write the test either today or in the future. Um, additionally, we have a, a special guest with us today who's actually the author of the VPC Best Practices, Mike Columbus, who will be signing autographs if anyone <laughs> wants. Mike, put your hand up. There, he's over there in the audience. If anyone wants to talk to him. But also, Matt, didn't you, you also worked on the certification, I, right? So, uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, so one more slide again. The Dory is open. It will stay open through April 25th, as we mentioned. Please, please add your questions there now or in the future. Um, we really look forward to engaging with you online. And take the survey, right? Let us know how we did. Let us know what things you want to hear about in the future, whether it's in print, online, whether it's in future next sessions. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to come to our session, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your week at Next. Thank you very much.